to get on to the bulk of my talk, which is eight conditions that optimize learning and development. These are early insights that Montessori had about how children, the conditions under which children learn well, which are well supported by psychology research today. There are eight conditions that I came up with from knowing Montessori and knowing the psychology research. Somebody else might have come up with a different eight, uh, but these are the ones that I saw. So I'm going to go through them briefly now, and then I'll go through them <coughs> one by one and we'll talk about the research behind them and how they're implemented in a Montessori classroom. So the first principle is that movement and cognition are very closely aligned, that we think better when our movement is linked with what it is that we're thinking about. The second principle is that children fare best when they have a sense of control over the environment. A third is that we learn very well when we're interested in what we're learning about. A fourth is that extrinsic rewards like grades and gold stars actually interfere with motivation to learn over the long haul. Fifth is that children can learn very well socially. A sixth is that we learn best when the context is meaningful to us, so when we're able to connect what it is that we're learning about to something else that, that we already know that's meaningful. The seventh is that there are certain forms of adult interaction that are known to be more positive for children's development than others. And an eighth is that children fare best when their environments are organized. Okay, so the first principle is that movement and cognition are closely aligned. In one study showing this, children watched as a carousel went around. And they were asked, what's moving faster? the objects on the outer rim of the carousel or the objects that are further in. And when children in elementary school say, watch this, they think, like most adults, based on our naive physics, that what's on the outside of the carousel and what's further in are moving at the same rate. However, when children are allowed to go up and actually move on the carousel, either on the outer position or on a further in position, then they realize that what's moving on the outside must be moving faster than what's further in. Children who watch the carousel over and over and over again don't come to this insight, but children who get up and actually are able to move their body do figure it out. Five months after they last performed in a play, actors better remember the lines that they spoke while they were moving across the stage than the lines that they spoke while they were standing still. And you may think, gee, that's just because it requires deeper processing to walk and talk at the same time. But when undergraduates are asked to recite monologues that they've been learning, undergraduates who are first asked to improvise what the character was like, act out what the character's like with their bodies, will remember more of that monologue than will undergraduates who are asked to write about the character, even though both of those require deep processing. Writing requires deep processing, as does acting out. The ones who act out what the character's like remember the monologue better. Finally, even facial movement assists our cognition. So we remember happy information best when we smile. We remember sad information best when we make a sad face. And when undergraduates have to memorize faces, say in a high school yearbook, they remember them well to the extent that they mimic the facial expressions as they're making them. And if you make undergraduates chew gum while they're memorizing the faces, their performance plummets. So, Movement then is very much, when movement and cognition are in line, we think better. But not only does it assist cognition when our movement is in line with it, in fact, our movements seem to even lead our cognition along, particularly our gestural movements seem to lead our cognition along. This is work that's been pioneered by Susan Goldenmeadow at the University of Chicago. Here we see a standard Piagetian number conservation task in which there are two rows of five pennies. And if you show this to a child who's five or six who doesn't yet have what Piaget called number conservation down, they'll look at this and, and they can tell you that these two rows of five pennies both have the same amount. But then if you spread one of the rows out, the child of five or six who doesn't have number conservation will now tell you that the bottom row has more. And yet, a child who is on the verge of getting number conservation, so a child who will get this soon, will, may show you with their gestures an incipient understanding of one-to-one -one correspondence. Say, for example, by pointing to a penny from the lower row to a penny in the upper row, one by one, they will show you an incipient understanding that these are the same. 
Uh, we also see in the transition when, when babies go from one word speech to two word speech, Susan Goldmeadow has pointed out that you also see this gesture leading cognition along. So for example, a child who has one word speech can say more and they can say milk, but they can't put them together and say more milk yet. However, a child who will soon be able to say more milk will go through a phase where they're able to insert one of those words with a gesture. So for example, they'll go milk using their more gesture. Those are the children that will be at two word speech next. So gestures then even seem to lead cognition. Now Manasari saw this close relationship between movement and cognition a hundred years ago. She said one of the greatest mistakes of our day is to think of movement by itself as apart from the higher functions. Mental development must be connected with movement and be dependent on it. And so all through the Montessori classroom then, there is movement. The child uh, with the red rods that I was just showing has picked them up, carried them over, really thought about, you know, by picking them up and putting them back down again, thought about that gradation from smallest to longest. And teachers say that when children first get those red rods, they don't even see the difference between the short one and the tall one. But through the process of holding them in their hands and picking them up and feeling the different weight and seeing how far apart their hands are, they actually come to appreciate that difference in dimension. And those red rods are actually, um, each one is 10 centimeters longer than the other one. Again, getting in the base 10 system and getting the child to think in terms of dimension. Those red rods move on to uh, red and blue rods where each 10 centimeter segment is painted alternately red and blue. And that leads on into mathematics where the child will put the four rod together with the two rod and see that they're the same as the six rod and so on. So in the same way that the reading and writing materials kind of incipiently get across the new understandings, the math materials do as well. In a Montessori classroom, again, there's movement everywhere. So for example, here we've got the child with the map the child will take out the map, come over, set it down on the rug. They will take out each piece. They'll trace around it as they say the name of the continent or the country. They will get out another piece of paper and, and a pin and make a pin map by cutting out the country. They will make labels for each of the countries and set them on. They later will get the flags and put them on. That will lead on into learning about the different cultures that, that live in these different countries. It's all about um, movement all the way through. Montessori said the child needs activity concentrated on some task that requires movement of the hand guided by the intellect. So it would make great sense then, given what we know about movement and cognition and their close alignment, to develop educational systems in which movement is, is very much incorporated. Because also not only does gesture lead cognition, but teachers are unconsciously aware of children's gestures and, and speech not matching. And when children's gestures seem to be ahead of their speech, teachers will give children more opportunities for learning. They'll present to them more different strategies and approaches for learning, and then those children advance more because of those, those additional strategies. So it would make sense then to design an educational system in which children are moving and teachers can learn from watching their movement and gesture, and in which children are learning even better because their movement is incorporated. And yet if you think about the factory style system and the behavior smell of a child, there's not a lot of opportunity for movement. Children are seated at desks, they're working in textbooks rather than, than with materials. And in fact, it would be very difficult to have materials if you're teaching the whole class at once in the same way for all of the children. It would require a warehouse of storage for all these materials for each child to have one set so they could all work together in lockstep in, in the classroom. Montessori works because there's one copy of each material in the classroom for the children to use because it's an individual education.